First off, we're going to see Mike Brodovsky. He's in the Midwest. He has a wonderful microphone collection. He also produced a new Deer Hoof record. Do yourself a favor. Go check it out. It is just ear candy. And his style and technique has a lot to do with why I even wanted to have a show called Manny's Mic Locker because I was so blown away by his style. It really motivated me to make sure that we could share um, new recording techniques, how to use mics. Some of these aren't vintage. They are hard to find, but it's for everyone. You can definitely find a mic in any budget to make this happen. Manny's Mic Locker, number two. Let's go. We're off to see Mike, and we're off to see the wizard. I called you. What's yeah. going on? Okay, I know you have a sick console, but for right now, we're going to censor that. Let's get straight to the meat and potatoes, man. Tell us about your mics. I'm stoked to be on the show. Thanks for having me, Manny. I do have a mic problem. Pretty, <laughs> pretty serious yeah. mic problem. Yeah. I don't know if you can. My buddy Will, uh, Will here is shooting. And so, Manny, I'm probably far away from the camera you're looking at. But so here, yeah. um, see, I just stepped on one. That's, that's how insane it is. So let me explain what's going on here. I told, I told, I texted you today. I said, people are going to think I know what's I'm, going on there. There's a problem. Yeah, That's what's going there's on. There's a problem, a serious problem. Okay. So my background is that I've been um, obsessed with recording since I was 15. So that's 1995. I decided right away, I, that's what I was going to do for a living. And I started doing it right away. And I pretty, pretty much haven't stopped. I uh, got an internship at Electrical Audio with Steve and Greg. And this is 2002. So that's, we share that in common that we both kind of started there and were heavily inspired by uh, such an amazing studio and um, amazing, amazing group of engineers. And Steve is so generous and uh, wealthy with his information. You know, I was a 22-year-old kid. I was probably super annoying, but he still put up with me. And, you know, and same as you, you know, he's, he's just a great guy. And then when I was there, his like, when I discovered all these two Blomo mics, it really blew my mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he told me something, you know, I was like, one of the things I talked to him, I remember, I was like, hey, man, like, I, I feel kind of bad or weird, like, really being into a mic because of how it looks, right? Because it's more about how it sounds. And he's like, well, no, you shouldn't feel bad about that at all. Because when you think about it, the person that designed the mic designed how it looks. Yeah. And uh, that... It all goes together, you know. You, you don't necessarily judge a book by by its cover, but a good book usually has a good cover. Um, yeah. I hope. I don't know if that's true. Don't quote me on that. But it kind of like, he, you know, because he's so pragmatic, and I thought he's like, yeah, he was going to tell me, like, yeah, it doesn't matter what it looks like. But then when he was like, yeah, of course it matters what they look like. And Russian mics are the coolest fucking looking mics. And then I did learn after, you know, over the years, you know, at first it was just like, oh, I put a mic up. How does it sound? But now, you know, I understand I've gone deep, right? Like I know every tube, yeah. transformer, yeah. Uh, the type of capsule, why it sounds the way it does, how many microns thick, what's the polarization voltage, why is it is the power supply regulated, unregulated, all yeah. these things that, that go into it. And then discovering that the design of these Russian mics, although it's inspired by a lot of the German classics, the Russians were definitely doing their own thing and they look different and they sound different and they're my some of my favorite mics i choose them despite having so many of the classics you know mm -hmm. we have a c12 a vintage c12 we have a m49b they're great mics you know we have cam 86s we have sony c37as and uh, we can talk about japanese mics too and i use them but uh I'm now really, always... you know, really quick when was it that you started accumulating all these mics like when did you actually buy it? what was the first mic that you spent a lot of money on and you were just like, oh, my God, like, that's a lot of money. But I see that you have a wicked, I can see the power supplies behind you. And we're talking, you can't even find those mics in one building. Yeah, and here you are can you zoom in on those right here. Supplies? I mean, so tell me, like, how did you even go about that? Or was it because of Albini being hip to those certain mics that those are the first ones you went after, like Sony C37s? Lomos, no, no. Like the order is different. So I remember my first time buying a uh, professional mic. Uh, a professional mic. I was in my dorm room and I got my first credit card. It was 98. It was a Discover card. And that Discover oh, card fucked me up for life, actually. Um, right. I finally got over that problem. And I think it's this first SM57, if I think about it. I had a $100 mm -hmm. limit and I got an SM57. I thought, this is it, man. 
And my <laughs> life is going to change because I'm recording yeah. on a shitty tiny board into like an Echo Layla. I don't know if you remember mm-hmm. all these things with my yeah. Event 2020 monitors and the SM57. Like, that's a real mic. And I was like, I can't believe I'm spending 100 bucks on a mic, but I'm going to do it, man. I'm going to max out my $100 credit card oh to get. And then I never, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And I didn't pay that thing. So that SM57 mm-hmm. ended up costing me like probably thousands of dollars oh, and man. a horrible credit score. And then it's, uh, we don't have to go into that. But I like the thought of that first SM57 really. But then after that, you know, I got deeper and deeper and I got really into the Russian mics. And so my first ribbon mic and my first Russian mic, uh, my first Russian mic was probably the Octava MKO12, MCO12 that everyone knows, the Guitar Center uh, Octava. And we can talk about that later, but that's a very different Octava. That's post-Soviet Octava. Very different than the vintage Octavas I'm going to show you, like this one. So this is the uh, Octava ML19. It is a uh, cardioid unidirectional ribbon microphone. Uh, This one's from 1983. So this was the last uh, ribbon mic they made. So Octava ribbon mics, M stands for microphone. L stands for lienta, which means ribbon. So that's microphone ribbon. And then the number 19, that's the 19th mic they designed. Mm-hmm. As, as mm-hmm. far, no, there's an ML20. It's a uh, reporter mic, like that Coles yeah. reporter mic, the STC something or other. Anyway, this was the first one I got. And I actually got it while I was interning at Electrical. And I brought them in because I saw Steve didn't have them. And I was like, look at these cool Russian ribbon mics. And he was stoked. And he was recording this band, uh, Valina, this Austrian band that became, they became pretty good buddies. And he used them for the overheads. And I was like, whoa, he's using my mics, you know, for overheads. And he's like, yeah, these sound, these sound really good. And, uh, and that was my first ribbon mic, my first Soviet mic. And I've learned a lot about them since then, which you and I have talked about. Um, there's a lot of improve. You can make, these mics sound, can sound really good right off the bat. It's shocking how much better they can sound when you do a couple things to them. As far as cool picks, um, He's life-changing for us being into old mics. He's one of the few guys. He's a really young guy, too. He's not even like, yeah, he's like some 70-year-old old. dude. He's super young, and he really tackles some of the most difficult uh, dynamic and ribbon mics to work on. And so our mutual f- friend, Cole, without even us talking right now, I think I have three mics he's working on. So I'll, I'll send a link for Cole as well. So if you are you have some dynamics and some ribbons you need some work on, uh, Cole is definitely your friend for sure. I only put out one of each mic, but we have at least a pair of every mic. That's how obsessive and OCD oh I am. And I obsessively try and get the serials as close together as possible. Some of this is not pragmatic. Some of this is that I have a problem, but uh, also uh, it allows me. I just, I went deep, man. I know everything about these mics. I love them. I use them. I obsess over them. What I forgot to say is the, so this, a lot of these Russian mics are um, versions or inspired by some of the classics. And so the ML19 is basically the Soviet version of an RCA BK5. Now to share people of your obsession on this, tell us how many of those 19s do you have? Oh, <laughs> well, so th- that's not about the obsession. That's because uh, I had the opportunity to acquire 45 new old stock oh my ML-19s God. Oh um, my from God, a buddy dude. in Belarus. So I have like over 20 years of collecting Russian mics. Uh, I know, and I speak Russian, which helps. So I know all these guys. And I've developed friendships with a lot of them. And especially my, my buddy, Sergei, in Belarus, he and I are, we're just buds. And he always is like, Hey, look what I found. Would you be interested in those? I was like, yeah, because, uh, I have the super special project I want to do with them. And if anyone is interested, it's going to be, there's nothing like it. It's going to be really eye opening for any mic enthusiast and to really see how important, um, even with a brand new ribbon mic, these were made cheaply. These guys, they sound fantastic, but they, the ribbon material is not great. It's very quickly and poorly installed. They made tons of, tons of these mics. But if you do a few simple things, because ribbon mics are simple. I mean, it's a transformer, magnet, and a ribbon, and a cable. Uh, unless we'll get into some of the Japanese, they get a little crazier. But um, that's basically it. Uh, and in some cases, an acoustic chamber with a cardioid. Uh, 
So if you do a few things, you could do a lot. But what I want to say, so this is the Soviet version of the BK-5. And I know you guys probably want to see some real rare stuff. We're never going to get through all 250 insane mics here, obviously. But this is one of the rarest uh, Soviet ribbon mics or ribbon mics that I have. And uh, this is a an ML-18. Oh, my God. Wow. So the ML-18, they made 20 of these. Uh-huh. Uh, and it is two ML-19s in one mic to make it hyperdirectional, so almost like a shotgun mic. Now, wow. the ML-19 is a copy of the BK-5, which everyone knows. The ML-18 is a copy of the BK-10, also known as the, Ber the Perry Como mic. They only made 200 of them. You can look up BK-10, and it is two BK-5s in a row. For picking up Perry Cuomo's voice on TV because he sang so quietly, and it was hyperdirectional boom mic, and so the Soviets literally took their copy of the BK-5 and made a copy of the Perry Cuomo mic, which is one of the rarest RCAs, to make their version of the rarest. So uh, this is one of my favorite mics to this day. Now it gets a little confusing here because the one I'm going to show you is not the one I bought. So some people may have seen this. These are vintage Octavas, and some may wow. be labeled Irpas. Those so, are beautiful. Oh, yeah. Well, and it's like... <laughs> <laughs> if if uh, it was called Noralco, you would think. Yeah. So <clears throat> the one I got looked just like this, and this was before mm -hmm. I knew anything about it. It was on eBay, probably 300 bucks, and it said MK13 tube mic. I didn't know any better. Multi-pattern tube mic. And wow. so I got it. It was my, I think, no, it was 800 bucks. Mm -hmm. And that was the most I'd ever spent on mic. It was crazy. This is 2001 or something. Is right? that the like C12A copy version of, of that? Is so that's that what, what a lot of doing? people say because of the shape of it. But it, yeah. it's actually a, a dual diaphragm M7 glue-on style capsule. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a multi-pattern M7 style capsule. So it's, uh, it, it does not follow the AKG family. It's more of a... Uh, a Neumann style mic, um, but this MK this is the MK thirteen M. The M is actually a T in Russian, and the T stands for transistor. So this is actually the MK thirteen M is actually a transistorized mic, and it uses germanium transistors, which give it. So the one I bought had been modified to be a tube mic. It had been modified to be this, which is the real MK13. So it's the long body version to accommodate the tube. Um, but my first one was a modified MK13M. Since then, I learned this was supposed to be transistorized. This is a real transistorized version, and it's one of my favorite mics because the Germanian transistors really um, saturate and compress. You know, people think, oh, tube mics like compress because of the tube. Tubes have a lot of, uh, uh, if they're not biased properly, maybe, but most tubes, tubes have a lot of headroom, and a lot of the compression people associate with tubes is actually from an unregulated power supply, so that when the uh, amplitude goes up, the, uh, the power supply sags, and the tube voltage goes down, and it's sort of a natural compression. Um, but the tube itself has a lot of headroom. But these germanium transistors in here, they saturate and break up very subtly, sort of like how a distressor distorts. It doesn't really distort, it like saturates a bit. Um, and you could put them on anything, and you don't have to use a compressor. Kick drum, vocal, mic, guitar, it's awesome. In this mic, it's not extreme, like it's really high fidelity, it's not like lo-fi. But you, even you look at the waveform, it's like, oh, you know, the, the transients are being chopped a bit, and it sounds great. It's like you don't have to do anything with it, and that's where mic selection comes in, right? So if you're looking for those, are they still, do you see those around still? The ones that are the transducers, not the tube? Yeah, so uh, I, I have restored, uh, I have seven restored ones. They mm -hmm, require a mm -hmm. lot of work. So the capsules are usually in bad shape. They oxidize pretty easily. The power supplies, uh, a lot of the capacitors blow up in the supplies and the switches. And then, so you can find them, but I have yet to come across one that works perfectly. I have yet to come across a single vintage Rush Soviet mic or maybe any mic. Any mic, yeah. Vintage, no matter what someone says, perfect, service, whatever. At least to my standards, for it to be working exactly as it should. 
And this is my yeah. big thing. Like a lot of people out there, and I, if if you're one of those professionals or whatever that's made a billion records and you say this stuff, I'm not trying to start an argument here. But a lot of people say, uh, you know, vintage original capsule, man, they all sound different. You got to find a good one. The reason the vintage mics are sounding different is because they're 60 or 70 years old. The Mylar has stiffened. So much shit has happened to that mic. It's not sounding the way it should. I'm not saying it's wrong to love an old mic that sounds different because that's the sound you love. That's great. But a lot of people are like, oh, reskin capsule, you know, it's not the same. If a capsule is reskinned properly the way it should be with the right thickness of diaphragm, the right diameter, everything's done properly, tensioned right, the back plate's tuned if needed, whatever, done exactly how it should be, it will sound exactly like your vintage U47 did the day it was made, <laughs> you know? So, like, it won't sound the same as a 70, 60-year-old U47 because it's not 60 years old. This is uh, the 1989a9. It's probably the most recognizable Lomo mic. Uh, Steve famously sold the pair he used um, on in utero for girls' overheads on reverb to a collector. <coughs> this is one of my favorite mics. It's a very simple mic. Uh, it has a single-sided M7, um, like, gluon large diaphragm. It uses a 6J1P tube. The power supply is critical to this mic, the original one, because it has the output transformer, a huge toroidal output transformer with um, a really unusually proprietarily high inductance. So you can't really find a replacement transformer, which is why the power supply is important. Anyway, I've had at least, at least 20 of these um, 1989s through the studio. And I've had ones that had original diaphragms that worked perfectly. Now we're talking, this mic is from 1963. So this oh mic God. is 60 years old. And I had four, that, four of them that were perfect. I set them up in an array so the diaphragms were as close together as possible. And I had my friends sing into all four of them. We listened back and you could not tell the difference. Obviously there's a difference acoustically, like they're not, right? There's distance between each mic. You'd flip the polarity on one another and it would cancel like 90%. The mic sounded virtually identical. And Neumann, to be honest, Neumann's like quality control and manufacturing specs were way tighter, way tighter tolerances than the Russian stuff. So anyway, there's real mic experts that can say more to that. Uh, you know, I work with John Peluso very closely. I don't trust anyone else with my Soviet mics. He's done hundreds of them. So along here to my right, are all condensers, tube condensers and uh, solid state condensers. And they start from a timeline uh, with tube <laughs> mics going all the way with all Soviet mics on the top. And then down here, we've got AKG C12, Neumann M49B. And then it goes through the Neumanns, then through all the Sonys, and then through all the others. And then down the middle here are all the ribbon mics with all the Soviet mics, the Toshiba Japanese, the Iowa Japanese ribbons, the national Japanese ribbons, and then all the other nationalities. We got Coles and Tannoy from the UK, Melodium from France, and then RCA, and then the modern AA mics over here. We have very few modern mics, except for ones that I feel do something better than the vintage ones. And then here we have all the dynamics, uh, all the Russian dynamics consecutive. So starting from, I guess those are the 40s, all the Russian mics, then my Fostec printed ribbon mics, which I'm obsessed with, and I used quite a few on that Deerhoof record. Then my Japanese dynamic mics, and then all the classic dynamic mics, most of which are German, and then some American. And so it's kind of fucked up because I know every single one of these mics very intimately. I'm totally a crazy person. We have very few modern mics, and this is not that's not like a snobby thing. It's just I'm interested in vintage mics and. Uh, but there are some that do things that some of the vintage mics can't. And so Peluso sent me these uh, P414s, and they are meant to be a recreation of the original C414EB with a brass capsule. This here is a C414EB with a nylon capsule, but from the outside, they pretty much look the same. And this I is, had one with a nylon and it sounded amazing. So they sound amazing. I they sound different. You. Yeah, but they, they yeah. sound amazing. They're a little 
brighter, more present, um, it seems. Um, but and you can look up, they, there's frequency response charts. They definitely have a different sound, but they're great mics too, yep. And this is his P414, which is a brass capsule reissue. You probably can't see the brass capsule in there, but um, they're incredibly affordable, especially when you consider what a brass capsule 414 goes for. And no, Peluso is not paying me to say this. <laughs> I'm just a fan of this mic. Um, he sent it to us to try to demo out, and I was like, sure. And I put them on toms, and it was like everyone at the studio was blown away. It's like, that's the best Tom mic we have. And then I go back. I was like, no, no, no. I've been using all these other mics for toms. Nope. The Peluso is like, it's like, wow, this is incredible. When I find something that works every single time, I just you use mic, it. It, it. And so he's gone over like some, there are some improvements. Like it's got better self noise. It's got more headroom than the vintage one. The polar patterns are in a different order, I think. I don't know why. Yeah. But it's really sturdy. It has been hit. I'm not precious about that stuff. And uh, it works every time. And that's honestly what you need, right? I just got this one back from John. And it's a big one for me. So I'll bring it out first. And if Sylvia's watching, she's going to be stoked to see it. So uh, this oh, wow. looks like a C37A. Yeah. But it is a CU1. And it's not made by Sony, technically. It's made by Tsushin Kogyo. I don't know if Will can get that close. Was that listed as a Sony C37, or was it just listed no. as that brand? It's Tsushin Kogyo. So the history is that Tsushin Kogyo is the name of Sony pre, I think it's 59, and then they just okay. changed it to Sony. But this is serial number 12. It. I'm not going to open it up now. I opened it up. I got it. It has the same very simple uh, cathode follower circuit with a 6AU6 tube inside, same, but the capsule's different. It's pre-Mylar, it's pre-polyester, I think, and it had a 58 micron thick copper diaphragm, which means it's one of Holy the earliest smoke. condenser mics. Um, it's obviously a precursor. I'll just show you the C, a classic C37A for reference, that they are obviously... Um, related. So this, Peluso actually found 48 mic. So 48 microns, to people that don't know, 48 microns is very thick. I believe, and I always forget, but I believe most modern capsules are like five to eight microns thick. And so 48 microns is incredibly thick. And he tried wow, a thinner, he tried a thinner uh, diaphragm, but it would get sucked into the back plate. So the way the mic is designed, it requires a thick, thick because there's so much voltage pulling on that, you know, like, yeah, yeah you, can, so it you, can, it you can shoot a hole right through your uh, capsule. Don't get addicted to mics out there. But if you do see one of these, you should grab one because this is serial number three. So there's at, at least two more in the world that have existed since the year 1961 in Soviet Russia. So I doubt there's another one. It's sort of a Lomo. We won't get, go into the complicated history of Russian mics. Soviet mics. Let's just say that it, Soviet Russia is not a capitalist society. Obviously, it's communist. They didn't make stuff for resale, really, or export. Um, they made stuff for the people, which was really cheaply, poorly made. And then they made stuff for governmental use for cinema, which was their most coveted form, art form, um, as Lenin famously said. Uh, and orchestra recordings, opera. And for and speeches, obviously. And for that stuff, they made one of a kind, sometimes five of a kind mics for the Kremlin or for like governmental use or for whatever their main orchestra hall was. And mm -hmm. so that's what this is. So Loma was a factory, not a brand. That's what people have to understand. Octava became a brand in the 90s when um, communism fell. But before that, it was a, the Octava factory. So the reason uh, all these old... Octava mics are ribbons is because the Octava factory was responsible for making dynamics and ribbons. The Lomo factory was responsible for making condenser and tube mics. But this is pre, it's not that it's pre-Lomo, it's this is was made by hand by the research department. This is the Len, this is Len Kinap. So this is, that's Lenin's Kinap, which is uh, cinema whatever. So this is Le Lenin's special, like really small department research department that designed mics for cinema. And this is one of three, and it's a precursor to the Lomo 19A14, but it's called the KMD2. 
KMD are the initials of the engineer that designed the mic, and I, for, I forget his name. Um, and so the Lomo 19A9 that we looked at before was originally called the Lennon the Len Kinap KMD1, and this is the KMD2. Now, here's the fucked up thing about this mic. This is a tube mic. Look at how small it is. It's like the size of the capsule. If you were to open it up, you'd see a sub-miniature tube behind the capsule, one capacitor, and the capsule. And then like the 19A9, the power supply houses the output transformer and everything else. So they basically designed like possibly the smallest. I'll show you the 19A14 that um, Lomo made, the Lomo factory made based on it. So this is the 19A14. And it's basically a 19A9 without, with a different tube. It uses a 631B. And the capsule is similar, but it has a, a resonant dead like back diaphragm, whereas the 19A9 has no diaphragm on the back. It's just one-sided. So these are all things um, that make slight differences in the sound of the mic. These mics have a little more high-end um, and less proximity effect. And the Lomo 19A9 is a little richer, like a U47, and has more proximity effect and is a little what you would call warmer sounding, for lack of a better term. So, so when are we going to get the Russian recording handbook on microphones and you're going to put all this down in paper so we can <laughs> walk around and carry it with us, you know? We want to have a mic menu that, uh, you know, like electrical sites, very useful. Like I, yeah. I used to reference it all the time. Like this Me sounds too. like this. Well, like uh, I can tell you now like exactly what mics are designed to be like. And this mic menu would have a photo of the mic say that have the history of the mic it yeah not just that it sounds like but it is quite literally a copy and in a lot of cases here and this is the big thing that we should talk about is especially with the japanese mics we all know the japanese they're meticulous yeah. and they will take an idea and they will improve it they will make it better all our cars are japanese cars because they they do it better man they uh and so all these japanese ribbon mics that are Influenced in some cases, almost identical copies. Yeah, you can even ask Cole. He's like, "Man, this Japanese RCA 44A copy is sounds better than the RCA." I'm like, "I know." This is a good transition for me to talk about like Russian, Japanese, whatever versions of the classic mics. Whether it's a ribbon, especially with the ribbons, I think is the most. Uh, stunning comparison like shockingly like whoa that's obviously a ja uh, japanese version of a bk5 i thought it might be fun if you say like a classic mic and then i'll find you um, well we were talking about initially about the rca junior which is a smaller version oh, of yeah. like a 44 and i think people always associate them as um they're kind of right there in the middle where they haven't really they're expensive but not that much you can still go out and grab them but I've grown to love these, and I think there's a lot of people out there that could be hip to those. What would be, do you have a version of a, of a yeah, junior or somewhere like that? Sort of. I think the closest is a Toshiba C type, and I don't have one. Cole sold, sold one that he got for me a while ago on Cole Picks, but this is the Toshiba Type F, um, and it looks like an RCA 44 Junior, but actually, this one's quite different, and it's pretty amazing. This is the closest thing I have now to an F-type, but the Toshiba C is smaller than a Junior. It's like really small. Sounds incredible. You can find them really cheap on Japanese auction sites sometimes. Um, the trouble with them is they have solder on ribbons, but Cole's, ma Cole's mastered those. Um, and he's fixed a couple Cs for me. Um, now really quick, with that long ribbon, did you notice any difference in the sound compared because it had a really long ribbon in it? Well, yeah, but here's the thing is because it's so long, they have these like welded bars. Oh, yeah, they sort go across like, the middle of it. Yeah, okay. and it didn't sound great. And I was like, I think those are there because the ribbon is so long to coal because John yeah. recreated that. And I was like, I'd like yeah. to hear it with the full ribbon intact. Do you think that's possible? I'll keep it vertical, you know, because a long ribbon yeah. can sag. And uh, Cole did it, and it's unbelievable how much better wow. the spike sounds. Like huge low end. I love it on guitars. Um, it's got this really cool mechanical um, knob that opens and closes a uh, sort of like a, a baffle that closes the back of the ribbon. So basically all the way open is figure eight, but when you close it, it becomes a pressure gradient 
omnidirectional mic. I love so I love that. It's cool, but uh, pressure. Uh, I don't know if you ever put like a RCA seventy seven in Omni. It's omnidirectional, but it sounds like garbage. <laughs> it's like really thin, but that's what a pressure gradient Omni sounds like. Yeah. Well, that'll that's a good transition to the most famous multi pattern. Wow. Ribbon mic of all time, right? The RCA yeah. 77D. Obviously a very famous mic. Of all the RCAs, I think the D is my favorite. I've had some DXs. I didn't like the sound of the DX so much. The D I really love. It's got a really useful sound. It actually surprisingly sounds good in all the patterns, I think. Uh, cardioid, figure eight, and all the in-betweens. And then, um, so I've loved this D quite a bit. And it's, I was like, ah, that might be one RCA. I won't find a Japanese one that will replace it. And then I scored this killer NHK version of an Iowa VM17. Oh, it's so cool. And um, on this one, I don't know if you can see, but you, so the Japanese make everything cooler. So instead of that clunky thing that you turn, you can't even see the arrow on the yeah, RCA, like yeah. which way is it pointing? This, yeah. it says you turn this way for bi-directional and this way for non-directional and anywhere in between. And here, there's a little meter, like a mechanical meter as you turn it, it goes up and shows you how far along you are on the polar pattern spectrum. Oh shoot, that's so and, rad. And inside, yeah, there's like a little like gate that opens and closes <laughs> the chamber. It's, the engineering is just brilliant. On every single ribbon mic, I don't know if you can see it, but there is a uh, five position high pass filter. Well, that's funny that you say that because people don't know it when, when people, and this is, uh, Cole had mentioned this, like when people get like, a, let's say an RCA Junior and you want to replace it, you're like, oh, I'll put a Cinemag in it. But they don't understand that, that those old transformers, they would cut some of the low end because all ribbons have a lot of low end and rumble. Exactly. But if you put it, if you put a Cinemag in it, you basically put it on tilt on low end and suddenly it becomes unusable because it's so boomy. deep. Yeah, it's so boomy. And then you don't like it, but the old transformers, a lot of them were made and like that one has the adjustment. You this know? one has the adjustment. And there's some Russian mics that people like get them. They're like, oh, this thing sounds terrible. They, a lot of Russian mics, they actually build in like a, a choke filter, bandpass filter, the ML11M is famous for that. It sounds f terrible, it's like bandpass, but it's because it was made for public announce. It's a cardioid mic with a choke filter so that it doesn't feed back and you just hear the voice. So you pull that choke filter out and like boom, the thing sounds um, um, like amazing. Like literally it goes from dog shit to like cheesecake. <laughs> so I just wanna show you this. So I showed you an old, Iowa VM17. This is an Iowa VM17 SA. This was their flagship ribbon mic. But here's the thing. RCA stopped making ribbon mics. Everyone stopped making ribbon mics and Iowa kept making them. They already improved them in the 60s and they kept going. And so this thing is from 1986, I think. And it is the next step. And it's like NASA grade uh, build quality. Um, What's the model of that one? What's the model number? It's the VM17SA. And uh, they're really rare. They've got a kind of an 80s look to them. But I did a post on, by the way, my Instagram for Mike stuff is um, Soviet American Audio Systems on Instagram. And I haven't posted in a year just because basically the pandemic ended and I have been doing sessions ever since. Um, but I have a plan to keep it going. Basically, it's me posting about all this stuff and taking photos. But I do, I do have a post on this mic, and the internals are, like, amazing. But the polar pattern is switched with this thumb wheel. And when you look inside, it's like a fucking greased, like, stainless steel, like, micro-machined chamber. It's, like, it's insane. It's got to be, like... So we have two of these that are, like, a few serials and num serial numbers are part, and they sound... 100% identical, which as you know, as a ribbon guy, that's like a, a pretty big challenge to get two ribbons. I mean, people make insane. a misconception. They get ribbons and they say the other match pair. It's really different. Maybe Royer can get close to them because Royer actually weighs the ribbon. They don't do it by, so that if you weigh the ribbons and you, and they match your transformers down to like, down to the wire, 
you can get a closer uh, match pair. But in the ribbon world, especially when we've got mics that have been re-ribboned, done by other people, and also some ribbons have been shot out, even if you get a pair, it's really difficult to get them both unless Cole does them at the same time, and then you you have a better chance of That's that what happening. I do. That's what I do with Cole, yeah. He, he does match them as close as possible for us. So this is the mic you were talking about. Yeah, that's it. <clears throat> this thing's brutally rare. So it's, um, so like I said, the Soviet mics, this is ML11B. So ML is microphone ribbon, ribbon mic. 11 is like the design. So this is the ML11B. There's also an ML11, which I don't own one, and I really desperately want one. So remember, there's no companies. There's just factories the factory, and departments. The factory. Factories and departments. So this department is MRTP. So if you find okay. a Soviet mic that's MRTP, IRPA, KINAP, those are all of like the bureaus of design and manufacturing. Those are like the highest end. The transformer in this mic is like this big. Um, it's way overbuilt. They maybe made 30 of them. No, it looks like 100. This one's serial number 94. It's from 1956. So this is a Soviet version of a 77, but in cardioid-only mode. It doesn't have a polar pattern switch, but it does have the chamber in the back with a tube that goes down through it. And uh, Peluso worked on this, and the mic is, this mic, you heard it on that, is so bright it sounds like a condenser. And I don't know if you've ever seen or heard uh, RCA 77A. Um, no, the no. Huge, they're crazy. My buddy at No Fun Club, the, the studio I designed in Canada, he's got a 77A. They're like this big, man. Wow. They look, when you, oh, it's, uh, so if you look at the deer hoof video. No, I know which one you're talking about. I actually had one of those, a buddy of mine had one. It was massive. It looks like a, it looks like a I rocket. Mean, bigger, it's like a football, bigger than a football. Bigger it's like than so a football. massive. Yeah. Yeah. So in that deer hoof, the when I the video I did of recording Satomi, we used a 77A with a C37A. Anyway, yeah, these that's the mic I was using on that video I posted. And um, the original transformer, here's another thing. Everyone's like, oh, big old transformers, man, they're better. Not always, or it depends what you're going for, but the mic was really bright with that transformer, too bright. Peluso put in his transformer. I kept the original in there. It's just a matter of resoldering the wires. When it came back with his tra his ribbon transformer, which I like quite a lot, it's a big secret uh, that people might not know about. His transformers sound good. His ribbon mic transformers. Uh, the mic came to life, man. Like shocking. The low end was even, not overwhelming, and uh, it really balanced it out. So um, that's the mic that you were talking about there. Oh, and here's an example. This is so. This is the Octava factory made the ML11, which is the same, but this is the ML11M. And this one is pretty rare. It's not nearly as rare as that, but this is the one that has the choke built into it. So I kept getting this. My I got like my hands on my first one. I'm like, this sounds like this sounds like dog shit. I got ripped off, and then the ribbon looks good, and I sent it off, or I opened it up, and I saw what's all this? There's like a capacitor and it's extra transformer what is this and then learn that it's a choke that they built in remove that and suddenly you got a full range <laughs> microphone wow. again. yeah these are great i've used these for overheads quite a bit too man your knowledge of all that stuff is just pretty deep man it's you should be like problem. you should be like 70 years old <laughs> uh, yeah it's uh, that's what well, we need that that's what we need your russian handbook man i'm telling you it'd be in my studio for sure it'd be cool yeah i uh it's um it's ADHD, man. <laughs> Got to constantly be these guys here. And it's like, I want to share this stuff because people should know about it. But you know, you know how people are on the internet. Oh, this, don't tell, don't ruin the secret. Fuck that, man. Plus, it's hard to find these things. Anyway. This is one of the coolest discoveries. And my buddy Luke Glickman kind of turned me on to him because we were both obsessed with the Japanese marketplace. You can find a lot of cool stuff there. Um, this is an Iowa. DM68A, and it, does it remind you of anything yet? Of course, the 19. Yep. And, uh, oh, the, it, oh, would be the a, it would be the AKG D19, which is famously known as the Ringo Stars overhead. Yes, yeah, and did we, did you get we yours? We were talking, yet? no, I got two of them, which are D119s, and they were, they're somewhat, they look a little bit like that one, but those oh, are right. AKG. 
These yeah, are, so it would be made in Japan. Yes, and so they're really well made. And you know, notoriously, the D19s capsules go bad. They're super unreliable. They look cooler than this, that's for sure. This mic is a studio favorite with every engineer, visiting engineer, visiting producer. It's like the number one piano mic, guitar amp mic. This mic sounds totally fucking awesome. If you look at the frequency res response chart, and that's what Luke showed me. He's like, dude, look, that looks like a D19. Look at the frequency response charts. They are like identical. Identical. Like, uh, obviously, there's more to a sound of a mic than it's just as frequency response. There's the phase, there's proximity effect, there's all well, kinds people, of stuff. People don't understand all those little vents on the side have a lot to do with the sound. You yeah, know? And if that's you cover like... that, it's going to sound different. So, like, if you're using this mic, have the vents facing out because you cover the vents, then it's going to fuck up the directionality. And the important thing is to get the, there's a, first of all, you have to get, this is the 250 ohm version. All Japanese mics that I've talked about, by the way, it has to be the low impedance version. That's the professional version. 250 ohm, 600 ohm. If it's 10K or any high impedance version, that is a mic meant to be plugged into a guitar amp or into a, sh it's like, and they are, they may look exactly the same, but they have different transformers. They're way more cheaply made. They're cheaper. I, I'm so obsessive. I have these Japanese catalogs of all these mics, Iowa, Sony, everyone. And I, and I translate them all and I go through and I go see what the specs are and why this and what they sold for and what year. And then I go through and do the calculation you, for inflation and exchange problem. rates. You, oh, you've dude. got a problem. <laughs> yeah, that's my wife and my kids and Will, uh, who's behind the camera. <laughs> oh, shoot. Uh, uh, but that's okay. You only live once, supposedly. So... Might as well get as much info as you can. But yeah, so look out. The DM68A has an XLR, three-pin XLR, and it's the good one. There is a DM68 without any letter after it, which uses some weird three-pin Japanese connector. Also good. The DM68 something else with a high impedance. Yep. It, again, it's like the difference between rotten eggs and homemade cupcakes. I'm new to this mic and it's a, it's a classic, but it's the, uh, this is actually the BF 509. Oh shoot. Do you know that anything about this? Yeah. Well, I, ha well, I have, it's a 409. I have a I mean, 409. I just got a 409. This is a 409. And if you don't know the story, um, you know, Mateus from Infernal Machine, the French guy, I got these from him. He, he, he's very knowledgeable about this stuff too. Basically, um, Sennheiser had some kind of a contract where they weren't allowed to sell mics in big box stores like Guitar Center, but the 409 was so popular. So they just changed the color and called it a Blackfire 509 and then <laughs> sold it. So wow. this is exactly a 409. It just looks different. The Sony C37P, basically the solid state version of the C37A. Same capsule, Sony mic, condenser mics, with a few exceptions, have a very neutral, mellow sound, which is what I really love about them. They don't have that, that presence peak or extended low end. It's like very flat. And this is a nice sort of rounder sounding mic with clarity. That's great on guitar amps. This is another, this is maybe one of my rarest mics. Another one has never been seen or found. Oh shoot, that looks amazing. It, it is. It's huge. This thing, this cable, donut thing that's attached to the cable is the output transformer. It has these huge cylindrical magnets you can't see, huge like cylinders, and then this long ass ribbon. It's really weirdly thin. It's a Kinap, so it's a Soviet mic. It has no model number. And when I got it, it was in like new condition in the original box, probably from the 40s or 50s. You son of a gun, you. And where do you use that one on the drum kit? So this was a this was my go-to outside. I love large ribbon mics for outside kick. A lot of people freak out about it. They're like, what? It's gonna blow the ribbon. If you're careful, I put three pop filters in front of it and I make sure it's not in yeah. front of the hole. It's the wind blast that busts bust the ribbon. Um, otherwise, it can handle a kick drum for a while. You'll have to replace the ribbon, but you gotta do that anyway. People don't realize I even put a pop filter in front of, um, I had a dynamic, I had a buyer. Uh, M88. Oh, well, okay. no, no, it was a, it was a TJ X50. 
Yep. And it used to pop a little bit, and I would put that. Or sometimes M88s are known for being low endy, but you can start to buckle those. And I'll put a pop filter in front of them, and it really does help. You know, even well, in front of the guitar. M88s, I've had two M88s blow out on a kick drum entirely as dynamics, so definitely useful. So anyway, that would be another popular. Now for my inside kick mic, and I'll go ahead and bring out my new favorite snare mic. Sorry, I'm, I'm talking loud because I'm walking away from the camera, but I realize I'm wearing a lav. So <laughs> then it seems like I'm yelling for no reason, and that's explaining why I'm doing that. Here are uh, my new favorite dynamic mics, Manny. And you can find these cheap. All right. I'm Yamaha. Ready. Yamaha MZ204. Dude, These I saw might... those on your last posting, and I was like, what the hell is that guy using Yamaha? Dude, What's going they're on? They're fucking awesome. They look lame, although they're Japanese, so they're so well machined. Look at this, like, machine. And then the XLR on the sides, genius for inside a kick drum. Um, this, this thing turns. You can really position it really well. So here's the trick with these Zam Yamaha MZ mics. They came out with them. They kind of flopped in the 90s. This is, so this is the kick drum mic. And they had two versions. This is just the MZ204. Now, this is the snare mic. It's MZ105. But this one's a BE. Okay. The BE means it uses a beryllium diaphragm. All right. Which they're the only ones to do it, which I guess is lighter and And how do you stronger. know this? How did, how did you figure this out? I just you, read about it. I you saw read the about thing. it and yeah. interpreted it from Japanese to English. No, no. To know what, uh, these, these were exported to the States. Okay. Yeah, you, you can read about them. There's like... Uh, there's this one post about a guy's like, hey, people make fun of these. This was my first mic I bought in Guitar Center in 92. It was really expensive. I thought I want to get this fancy mic. And then no one bought them. But I've been using oh, it ever man. since for like live sound, I think. But yeah, yeah. this has been my snare mic and then my inside kick mic for the past few months. Uh, another one, my favorite, favorite ribbon mics of all time. If you get one ribbon mic. Oh, they're so hard to find. But these mics are awesome. This is, I was like... The final mic they made is the, the VM20A, this tiny little guy. It sounds heroic, man. Like, high, like, the fidelity is unreal. Anyway, that's what I used. So you place it like this and point it at the shell. And so it's like equidistant from a snare, rack tom, floor tom, and then kick drum below it. But then you, got, you usually have this asshole ride. <laughs> yeah you know and then the asshole drummer who's playing it wants it so close and you gotta you gotta move well, no, it and then they crash they crash on the ride that's great i'm always like hey i love how you, it's your choice how you want to drum i'm totally into it but that's gonna sound it's really hard to record that but it's my job it's our job as engineers to like let the drummer play the way they want to play and the thing they wrote that's their thing it's our job to like deal with it so I like to pick a figure eight in that position, and then I position it so that the null is facing Nulls that ride. on the side, yeah, yeah. It's amazing how useful the null on a figure eight is uh, and what a troubleshooting design that is. It literally removes the fucking ride from the, the, uh, from the mic. Um, so that's what I do there, yeah. And I, I usually, that's like the one mic. I don't typically squash things on the way in, but I like to put a nice snappy pumpy compressor on this one and then i usually blend it in if i have like wide overheads it ties in the center so that they don't sound you know that pss, pss, pss sound it fills in the center and really ties the kit together and usually like the tone of the snare is found in that go to bottom snare is another great mic that people should know about well um if you're familiar with alan sides of ocean way no. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He, I've heard he famously ways. claimed that this is the best mic ever made and had something like 35 of them at Ocean Way. Oh, my God. Um, and it's a Sony C55. And I remember seeing Steve somewhere. And he was like, oh, I just came back from the session at whatever, the studio with all the C55s, which I think is so funny. It's like, I didn't know then, but I was like, oh, he was talking about Ocean Way. Why didn't he just say yeah, yeah. Ocean Way? Ocean Way, it's pretty I know. famous studio, Steve. But... um. Did he like, like them? Yeah. Did he use them? Oh, yeah. He, he said he used them everywhere. They're awesome. But so it's a medium diaphragm condenser mic it's from the 70s. And I don't know, Will, if you can see this, but I don't Can you see that little arrow? So this is the C55P. There's also an AC I'll talk about. So when the arrow's pointing this way, 
the capsule is pointing this way and its end address. Then you just take your fingers and you turn it. And now the arrow is pointing this way. Dude, that is insane. the capsule is pointing this way. That and now is, it's that's a tom mic or whatever you want. Oh my God. What are well, you, you using can also, that on? Oh, that's a bottom you can of also go half. You can also go halfway. So you can like, so you put position your mic and instead of having to fuck with everything, you just turn this capsule and point exactly where you want it. So yeah. this has been my favorite bottom mic. It's a, it's one of the few like brighter, sparklier Sony mics. And it's great to pick up that, the sizzle. Do you use it anywhere snare. else or have you used those anywhere else? Oh yeah. I've used them as overheads. They're very clear. They're really, I mean, they're, this is a workhorse mic. You can put it on a vocal on anything. And I think that's why Alan Side said, he seems like a pragmatist. He says, Hey, you know what? We need a bunch of these because they literally work in every situation. Yeah. So I love the Coke bottles on the floor, Albini style. I do that a lot. One thing that a lot of people don't know about is the difference between the 21B and 21D capsule. And I'd love to uh, help yep. people understand the difference because there's a difference. So the 21, this is a 21D here on this totally insane thing that finally it was on reverb forever and the dude finally dropped the price and if you're watching dude thanks i'm stoked this is a really rare like desk mount or wall mount version of the 21 <laughs> d he was asking like a couple thousand bucks i was like dude it's a piece of metal with a tube in it a cheap tube finally it got down to like two or three hundred bucks i was like i'll take it so the 21 b i don't know will if you can see that so this is a 21 b capsule you'll see it has little slits along the side and then on the front, it's flat. So the sound enters the side of the mic and passes across the top ah, of the capsule. Okay. The reason the B is, has the slits on the side, it's designed to be a vocal mic. There's an ad that shows an opera, opera singer singing into it. it. A vocal mic that is so low profile that it doesn't get in the way of the face, and then you sing into the side of it so it's not in front of your face. The 21D, I don't know if you can see this. They're all on. This is still Omni. So they're both Omni. Yeah. That's the other thing. Some people think that the D is cardioid, which it's not. It's slightly more directional on high frequencies, but not enough to matter. So this has holes cut in the front. On the side, there is no slit. This mic sounds for general recording room mics, overheads, maybe the most beautiful sounding mic I've ever heard with a 21D. 21B, use it for wow. room mics. It has weird phase issues in the upper frequencies. It's a little harsh. They sound dramatically different. They're intended for two, they're two different purposes. So I actually like the Bs for room mics because the high end goes down a bit. But for like acoustic guitar and overheads, like in a dead room, the 21D is some of my best sounding drums in acoustic recordings. I have this one song I recorded for this band, Bullet Points. I just used one 21D. He sang and, play, sang and played acoustic guitar live in the dead room, and I just placed one mic and caught the whole thing. And it's one of the best like live acoustic guitar sounds I've gotten. Hey guys, I'm Cole and I own a business called Colpix Vintage where I do repairs on ribbon and dynamic microphones. Manny asked me to come on and give just a quick pitch of my services. So if you need any help with any ribbons or dynamics, I work on a lot of AKG D12s, anything like that, any microphone that you need re-ribboned, I can help you out. Hopefully you enjoyed watching this video of Manny's mic locker. I'm certainly pumped to check out all the videos. And yeah, again, if you need any help with any microphone repairs, I'm here to help. You can go to my website, colpixvintage.com.